students, welcome. Um, just a couple of things before we get started. Uh, today's lecture is going to be on the chapters in the book on learning, and I'm going to be, you know, hitting the main points in lecture. Um, but I want to just remind you that the book becomes extra important right now because of, uh, you know, the situation that we're in. Um, I'm going to try to simplify things for all of us. I am um, going to be very realistic about what we're facing over the next number of weeks. This is not an online course. It's been converted into one, but uh, it's going to be rough uh, for a while and a lot of rough edges, so to speak. But uh, we're going to get it done. You're going to learn what you need to learn, and uh, we're going to keep it simple. So I hope everybody's doing well. Um, it's been an interesting experience, spending a lot of time indoors. I'm getting my calluses back in terms of playing the guitar again and catching up on all my different things that I don't have enough time to do. Um, and you'll be getting some emails from me in the next couple of days about how to use this lecture. And I thought just to get things going that I wanted to show you my yoga cat uh, I don't know why, I just needed you to see this. I suspect that over the next few weeks as this goes on, um, my real cat's up. Oh, there's, there's Layla in the corner. She just rolled, she's, um, uh, from your perspective, uh, my left shoulder. That's, uh, my Russian blue. I will try to teach things other than just talking about cats if I'm able to. Um, so... Okay, so we're in process. Um, you know, the college is taking it week by week, but um, my best guess is that we are gonna be doing this the rest of the semester. I would be very surprised otherwise. All right, so just to pick up, um, I'm really now, this is for my three intro psych sections, and today we're covering learning, I think, you should all have the learning review sheet from a couple of weeks ago or from a week and a half ago. Um, and we have just kind of following along with that. We've defined learning and uh, you've got that definition in your notes. It's also in the textbook. What I was focusing on our last face-to-face -face was three types of behaviors that fool people. And the reason they fool people is they look like they involve learning, but really they're innate, they're inborn. And the first one that we were talking about, the first group of behaviors are reflexes. So reflexes are defined as simple inborn behaviors. They're found in all healthy human infants. And the reason we're born with reflexes is it increases the likelihood that we will survive. Uh, let's just review. We talked about uh, the sucking reflex. In a healthy infant, they have a strong, vigorous sucking reflex, and that's how they take in nourishment. The reason we're concerned about premature infants is often preemies are born with a weak sucking reflex, so they have to be monitored very closely. We also talked, I believe, about the rooting reflex. The rooting reflex is how newborn infants uh, locate the nipple. And so when a mother holds a newborn infant up to her chest, uh, her breast touches the cheek and the infant turns their head in that direction. And I was giving you the sick image of how to entertain yourself with a newborn baby. Just keep going like this and they'll move their head back and forth. Um, let's just name a couple of other reflexes. I think we talked about the startled reflex, which is when an infant is startled, they'll fling their arms and legs wide, their pupils will dilate. And if you count slowly to three, by the time you get to the number three, they'll scream at the top of their lungs. Obviously, the purpose of that reflex is to engage the caregiver to come and see what's going on. A couple of other reflexes. Healthy infants have a grasping reflex. And so if you take a healthy infant's newborn hand and you put something in their palm, they'll lock down with a death grip. And when an infant is born, one of the things that uh, docs will do is they'll make sure there's a vigorous grasping reflex. The grasping reflex is actually how um, our, um, should plug this in here, it's how our um, evolutionary ancestors stayed attached 
the baby stayed attached to the mother. Think of a mother primate covered in fur. The grasping reflex is how they stay connected. And um, the, 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 the safest place for a newborn infant is physically connected to their mother via the grasping reflex, but also the sucking reflex is how they take in nourishment from mom. So obviously these are survival reflexes. There's a lot of other reflexes that newborn infants are born with. Uh, one more example that really reflects the story of human evolution is what's called the walking reflex. So if you take a newborn baby and hold them under their arms and bring them down so their feet touch a surface, they'll begin to take stepping motions. Now, in terms of maturation, they're not ready to walk. They can't do that. But they're born with a reflex which will appear again. It will disappear shortly after birth and reappear again months down the road when they're capable of really walking once their body has matured. Okay, so moving on from reflexes, let's talk a little bit about instincts. Instincts are complex in born behavior. So reflexes are simple, instincts are complicated. They involve a lot more things going on in the behavior rather than simply like an eye blink reflex. There's a debate in psychology and has been for a long time as to whether humans are born with reflexes in the same way that other animals are. It is really clear that in, in other animals, a lot of their behavior is driven by instinct. The, the debate is whether humans having more complex brain are as instinct dependent as other animals are. While there's no consensus, the general trend is most psychologists believe that humans don't have instinctive behaviors as rigidly controlling us as you would see in, let's say, a dog or a wolf. That's a debate. But let me mention a couple of instincts that we, we see in uh, newborn animals. And a good example is migratory instincts in different species of birds. Um, many species of birds are instinctively programmed to engage in migratory behavior where they fly from one part of the world to another part of the world thousands of miles away at certain times of the year. And um, the instincts that control migration in birds are, are hardwired into the brain of an infant bird. So, so how do birds know when it's time to migrate? Well, some of it has to do with temperature. You know, when the temperature gets colder, that can trigger migration. But it mostly has to do with the amount of sunlight that's, that's hitting um, a bird's eye every day of the year. So in the fall, in the northern hemisphere, when sunlight starts to decrease, uh, that lack of sunlight on the retina of a bird's, brain, of a bird's eye triggers changes in the brain that motivate, that begin to prepare that bird uh, to migrate. And of course, that's not learned. That's hardwired in there. Um, the actual ways that in which birds instinctively migrate is fascinating. Some birds migrate, some species, because they have a brain that is sensitive to magnetic energy in the Earth's crust. In other words, the way that they know how to get from point A to point B in different parts of the world is their brains are following a, a magnetic map um, where the brain is matching up with the magnetic surface of the, of the earth below them. And again, that's incredibly impressive, but it is not learned. It's a hard wiring. Other birds migrate because their brains are genetically programmed to maintain a certain angle of flight relative to the sun or relative to a star in the night sky. That's pretty impressive. But again, it, it doesn't fundamentally involve much learning. It's hardwired. Um, humans probably have tendencies, genetic tendencies, but because our brains are so capable of learning, there's evidence that those genetic tendencies can be kind of overruled or altered by uh, life experience. So, um, you know, the debate has always been like um, many 
animals, male animals like wolves will fight at certain times of the year to establish a dominance hierarchy. And those fights are really interesting because they're scripted by instinct. When one of those wolves is losing, he is instinctively genetically programmed to lie down and expose his belly, which is of course the most vulnerable part of an animal. But the moment he assumes that submissive posture, the dominant wolf will uh, instinctively be required to break off that fight. So the dominant wolf will take those giant canines and kind of snap a few times and then generally withdraw. Let's compare that to human men. Uh, let's imagine that uh, you and I, whoever is out there, we're in an alley fight. What I'm doing in an alley is unclear. I shouldn't be there anyway, but there I am. And you punch me and I fall to the ground like this in the human equivalent posture of a losing wolf. The question now becomes, are you as a human male instinctively required genetically to break off the fight? Or does that have a lot to do with who you are and what you've learned as an individual? And the answer to that is you are not instinctively programmed to break off that fight. It depends on what you've learned. Do you have good control over your anger? Have you learned a morality? Have you learned uh, to empathize with other people, right? So I might be lucky or I might be dead, but that's not instinctively driven. So that's an example of one of the ways in which the human human behavior is not identical to the behavior of other animals. Uh, the third, if you look at your review sheet, the third type of unlearned behavior that I want to talk about is called maturation, or also known as maturational changes. Simply put, the, um, the human body is genetically programmed for certain abilities to mature or appear at certain points in time. And again, this is not about learning. This is about wiring, you know, pre-programming in the brain. We often say that our child has learned to walk. And learning is part of how we develop that ability. But you cannot teach a child to walk successfully until their body is matured enough to be able to do that. In other words, the body has to physically be ready for walking. Parts of the brain have to control, have to get hooked up to different muscles in the body. The muscles themselves have to strengthen. The joints and the skeleton have to get stronger to hold body weight successfully. So no matter how much, no matter how talented your kid is, if you try to teach a child to walk before their body has matured to that point, it's a lose-lose. You're going to make them miserable and you're going to make yourself miserable. Another example would be potty training, right? Toilet training. You cannot successfully potty train a kid until their brain has control over their bladder and their bowel muscles. And that takes months of physical maturation to develop. So if you try to potty train a child before they're physically mature enough, again, you're making them miserable and you're getting yourself frustrated. And the question is, why are you doing it? It doesn't make any real sense. Now, if you've raised kids before, you know that as children get physically ready and matured to be able to be potty trained, they tell you. They either tell you directly or they do the pee-pee dance, as it is called, um, or they'll actually start to take off their wet, soggy diapers because they don't like the way that feels. And those are all indications of what is called maturational readiness. They're letting you know that, you know, they're getting to the point physically that they can do that. Okay, so just to sum up, reflexes, instincts, maturational changes, there are three different kinds of behaviors that trick us because they look like they involve learning, but they really don't. All right, so if that's what learning is not, let's talk now about what learning is. We're going to take a quick look at three different types of learning. Learning is a complicated business. Animals learn in different ways. Now, you and I as humans because our brains are so sophisticated. You and I and primates and other highly social animals are capable of all three types of learning that we're gonna talk about. Animals with simple brains might not be capable of all three and only be capable of basically two of the three types of learning that we're gonna be discussing. Um, now I wanna remind you that um, this talk 
There's a lot in the book in modules nine and 10 on the, these three types of learning. So please, you know, using the book in this weird time we're in becomes extra important for you in terms of mastering the material. So the three types of learning we're gonna look at, number one, we're gonna start with the simplest. That's called classical conditioning. You've all heard of it. The famous name associated with that was Pavlov, P-A-V-L-O-V. We're gonna look at a second type of learning called operant conditioning. Um, and the famous name associated with that was B.F. Skinner, the creator of the Skinner box. And then the third type of learning we're gonna look at is called social observational learning. And that the name associated with that is Albert Bandura, B-A-N-D-U-R-A. You and I are capable of all three. Some animals are not capable of the third type called social learning. So let's start with classical conditioning. And the reason it's called classical, it was the first type of learning to really be studied. And it was studied about 100 years ago and kind of understood by a Russian scientist named Ivan Pavlov. Pavlov was not a psychologist. He was actually a scientist who was studying salivation in dogs. An interesting life choice. What do you do for a living? I study dogs drooling. But that was his thing. Uh, he discovered something. Some people think he discovered it by accident. We don't know for sure. And that's the only reason we know his name 100 years later. <laughs> Had he just focused on studying the salivary glands in a dog's mouth, he would be lost. He would be some obscure scientist who nobody knew about. But um, one of the things that he discovered, maybe by accident, is that if a hungry dog is exposed at the same moment to food and to the ringing of a bell, then what will happen very quickly is that hungry dog will associate the ringing of the bell with the expectation of food about to arrive and thus the dog will salivate. So if you take a hungry dog and you, and you show it, expose it to a bowl of, let's say, meat powder, dried meat, that dog will automatically salivate. Now that has nothing to do with learning. That's an automatic reflex. And that's true for you and I as humans. When we're hungry, we salivate more than when our bellies are full. So that's true for all animals. If at about the same moment, you expose a hungry dog to, to meat powder, you also ring a bell and it hears that bell. That dog in its brain will form an association between the sound of the bell and expecting the arrival of food. In other words, in that dog's brain, a, an electrical connection, a neurological connection will be made between the sound of the bell and ex the expectation of food. From that point on for a while, if you ring the bell by itself without the dog smelling or, or seeing food, the dog will salivate. So the dog in its brain formed a connection between bell and salivation. Now, Pavlov discovered this about a century ago, but you and I know this intuitively from our own day-to-day -day lives. Uh, those of you who smoke cigarettes or vape know that some of the moments that you're actually gonna vape or light up a cigarette are not random. They are based on an association in your brain between some sort of experience and wanting to, let's say, light up a cigarette. Let me use that example. So when I was a smoker at one point, I had an association, a learned connection in my brain between a cup of coffee and wanting a cigarette. And once you build that, actually classical conditioning is all about building simple habits. It becomes a habit once that connection gets established, right? And so coffee and a cup of coffee is put down in front of you and suddenly you got a lit cigarette and you might not have even consciously remembered lighting that cigarette. It can take on a life of its own. Um, <clears throat> this can be a very good thing, right? 
when you're walking to your car in a parking lot, you don't have to think through every single association that you need to do to get in your car and drive away, right? You see your car, you open the, you unlock the door. You unlock the door, the next association is you open the door. After you've opened the door, the next association is you get into the car and, you know, put on your seatbelt. You close the door, you start the engine, you put on music, click, click, click. So a lot of our day-to-day -day behaviors, when we do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, are based on classical conditioning. <clears throat> okay, so what is it that drives classical conditioning? Well, it's a very simple law called the law of association. And the law of association was first explored again by Pavlov about 100 years ago. Um, let me give it to you and, you know, get it into your notes. But again, you know the drill. You don't need to memorize it. You need to understand it. Um, here it is. When two events co-occur, a mental association will be formed between those two events. So let's just think about that. Right? When two events co-occur, when two th things happen to you at the same time, your brain will automatically form a mental association between them. You can't help it. It's not under your conscious control. It's the way the brain works. That's part one. Here comes part two. Later on, if one of those two events reoccurs, the second event will tend to follow automatically. So if your brain has formed an association between dog and fear, right? That you might have a dog phobia, okay? Later on in time, once your brain has locked that together, when you see a dog, you'll re-experience the fear, right? So we connect things together via the law of association, and then later on, one will trigger the other. Now, that is a simple habit. It can be a good thing. It can sometimes be a bad thing. It right? depends on what the association is. Early in my career, I worked with a number of Vietnam vets who had PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Some of their symptoms were tied to a habit based on classical conditioning and the law of association. To give you an example, some of my Vietnam vets <clears throat> with PTSD had formed an association years earlier between the smell of swamps, like that swamp smell on a hot, humid day in Vietnam and being terrified in a rice paddy, the smell of swamp and having some sort of a firefight and you know being terribly frightened. Years later, some of those Vietnam vets, they do okay in the winter in Sussex County because it's cold and it doesn't smell swampy, but on a summer day, this driving somewhere, the smell of that swamp, could that, through the law of association, reopen that experience of trauma, of fear? And the answer is yes. So that's the bad news. Here's the good news. Remember that learning is reversible. We can learn something, unlearn it, and then relearn something uh, different. I see my cat in the corner there. That's Layla. So Layla. Typical cat, completely ignoring me. Business as usual. Okay, sorry. Um, the way to get over a classically conditioned fear is to re-expose yourself to what is called the stimulus, the trigger, over and over and over again until the fear level, which is the response, gradually drops. So... Now, this sounds easy, and you and I know in real life it can be very frightening to do this. But for those Vietnam vets, part of the treatment is to break that connection, right? They formed an association. We want to help them make it weaker and disconnect. And that involves smelling that swamp smell over and over and over again over a period of days or weeks. And as they practice that, the fear response gradually starts to decrease, that is called extinction, right? And you can read about that in your textbook. So 
let me focus you on that. That's something you want to take a look at. Um, many phobias are learned through classical conditioning. You're at the wrong place at the wrong time, and your brain forms a, a connection between a particular thing. It could be a car, it could be a smell, it could be a dog, could be water, and the response of fear, all right? And so you, we can use extinction in, as ther in therapy or on your own to help disconnect those two things, right? Okay. Um, there's more to classical conditioning. Let me again ask you to go to the book and dig into that. So we're going to move now to our second type of learning. It's called operant conditioning, O-P-E-R-A-N-T. It is also sometimes called classical. Um, I'm sorry, not classical. It's sometimes called instrumental conditioning. Just lost you there for a moment. Okay, we're back. The, um, the famous name associated with this type of learning, and it's a simple type of learning also, is B.F. Skinner. Uh, you probably recognize the name Skinner. In the 1950s, Skinner created a contraption called the Skinner Box, and basically you put a laboratory rat into this box, and by controlling reward and punishment to the rat, you can increase certain behaviors in that rat and decrease other behaviors. So I just gave you the clue to what instrumental conditioning really is about. Uh, operant or instrumental conditioning is really about using the principles of reward and punishment to change behaviors. And that might sound a little out there to you, but frankly, you and I all know this intimately. Our parents, in their own ways, used reward and punishment on us growing up to try to, to try to motivate us to do more of certain behaviors and less of other behaviors. Those of you who have trained uh, a pet, think about how we train a dog or how we try to train a cat, usually unsuccessfully. To train a dog, we use the principles of reinforcement or reward. The correct term is reinforcement and punishment. So when a dog produces a behavior and you want to encourage that behavior and motivate the dog to do that behavior more frequently in the future, you give it some sort of a reward. Now there's different types of rewards, right? Um, food is a reward if the dog is hungry, but dogs being very focused on humans, actually you get better results when you don't just use food, but when you use what they crave, which is social, social praise and approval. Uh, compare that to cats, right? Cats are different than dogs, and they do not respond in exactly the same way to human praise and approval that dogs do. They actually do, but it's a more subtle sort of thing, right? But if you think about it, all animals obey the fundamental rules of operant conditioning. All animals obey the the wiring in the brain that when we do something and then we feel good, it motivates us to do it again. And when we do the same thing, and this time we don't feel good, but we feel bad, we get punished, it generally makes it less likely for us to do that behavior again. Now, that's a little too simple. Life is more complicated. Sometimes even when we get punished for something, we're also still getting rewarded for it. And if the reward is more powerful than the punishment is, we're going to keep doing it. Sometimes when we get punished from some, for something, in the long run, we'll eventually stop doing it. But in the short run, we might be motivated to do it even more. And there are reasons for that. So like everything else in life, it sounds simple, but there's, it's more nuanced. There's more subtlety to what's going on. So... Classical conditioning was based on the law of association. Operant conditioning is based on a different law. It is based on what is called the law of effect with an E, E-F-F-E-C-T. It is technically called Thorndike's law of effect. Thorndike, T-H-O-R-N-D-I-K-E, was an early psychologist, pre-Skinner, 
who um, basically founded kind of, he was like the starting place for what became operant conditioning. So let me give you Thorndike's law of effect, and then we'll talk about it. Here it is, Thorndike's law of effect. Behaviors followed by pleasant consequences will increase in frequency. And here's the flip. Behaviors followed by unpleasant consequences will decrease in frequency. So Thorndike's law of effect. When an animal, including you or me, produces a behavior, and right after that behavior is done, something pleasant happens to the animal. The animal is mathematically more likely to do that behavior again in the future. And the reverse. When an animal produces a behavior, and shortly right after that behavior is done, it is, uh, the animal has an unpleasant consequence, something bad through the animal's experience, the animal will be less likely to do that behavior again in the future. Now, this is based on something most of us heard growing up. Uh, I mean, how many of you can remember a time in life when uh, a mom or a dad or a teacher said, your behaviors have consequences? I think, I dream about that still, having heard that so much. The idea that behaviors have consequences is something that we hear a lot from people around us. And of course, it's really true. Behaviors do have consequences. Thorndike's law of an effect is simply uh, uh, redefining that in a more specific way. So now let's take Thorndike's law of effect, and we're gonna turn it from Thorndike to Skinner's language, all right? Behaviors followed by pleasant consequences tend to increase. Well, Skinner called behaviors responses. So we'll substitute the word response or plural responses. And he called pleasant consequences reinforcers. In common English, they're also called rewards, but we're going to call them reinforcers. So think of it this way. Responses followed by reinforcers or reinforcement will tend to increase. And here comes the opposite. Responses followed by punishers or unpleasant consequences will tend to decrease. That is the modern version of the law of effect. So when you and I produce a behavior, it's called a response. If we get re reinforced for it, we're more likely to do it again. If we start with exactly the same behavior, and this time we experience punishment or a punisher, we are less likely to do it again. This law of effect, which underlies operant conditioning, is essentially true for all animals. Even animals with tiny, simple brains obey the law of effect. Now, here's where it gets more nuanced, <clears throat> and it's, this is important. In real life, most of the things you and I do have a mix of consequences. Some consequences are reinforcing, and at the same time, there could be other consequences that are punishing, right? Um, <clears throat> think about being in a relationship. There are moments in a relationship where we reinforce each other's behaviors, which motivate us to stay engaged with the other person. But in real life, are there moments that we punish each other, which make us less motivated to stay in the relationship, right? Or let's take an example of um, vaping or smoking cigarettes, right? There are rewards, i.e. reinforcers associated with smoking cigarettes or vaping. If there were no reinforcers, people would never do those things. We do it because it's rewarding. Would you agree though, there's also punishers, downsides to vaping or smoking cigarettes, right? If through your eyes, the reinforcers for you are more powerful than the punishers, then you're gonna continue the behavior. If, on the other hand, something changed in you and the punishers or the pain outweigh the reinforcers or the pleasure, then you're gonna to start to let go of that behavior. So in real life, many of the things we do have a mix of rewards and punishment all blended together. 
you determine through your psychology what the balance is between the upside versus the downside. Now, as simple as that idea is, <clears throat> there's something really important about it. This concept of a mix of reinforcers and punishers can explain the complexity of many things, including addictive behaviors. People who are addicted to drugs or addicted to gambling or addicted to sex or whatever it is, when they really stop and explore why, will almost always, if they're honest, recognize that that behavior, that addictive behavior, has not one consequence, but numerous consequences. Some of those consequences are reinforcing. They make you want to keep using. Other consequences are punishing. They motivate you to quit using. When somebody is currently addicted to a drug, whether it's a mix, there are both physical and psychological reinforcers that keep them stuck in the addictive cycle, in the addictive loop. All right. Let's take alcohol. You know that the nickname for alcohol is liquid Xanax. Good nickname, right? Alcohol essentially functions as a CNS depressant. It functions as a, as a liquid form of a tranquilizer. So could one of the reinforcers that keep drinkers drinking is that they're using it as a way to calm themselves down, both psychologically as well as uh, physically, neurologically, right? Um, <clears throat> Do some drinkers drink because of social reinforcement? It's a way of feeling connected to other people. It's a way of bonding with other people. And this is true for cigarette smoking as well as a lot of addictions, right? It's a way of making social connections. So if you say to somebody who drinks because it calms them down and because of the social reward, if you say to them, well, just stop doing it. I mean, yeah, you're kind of missing the boat on that one. The reason they're doing it is they're getting certain powerful rewards for doing it, right? Now, will they also recognize that there's punishment involved, right? You get sick, health consequences. There are people who are going to judge you and look at you in certain ways you don't want to be looked at. It costs money, right? It Fs up other parts of your life. I mean, yeah, but if you're still doing it, then through your eyes, your mindset, the reinforcers are more potent to you than the punishers. So to a psychologist, if you want to help somebody with addictions, you need to start off by recognizing the truth. You and I, forget addictions, you and I all sometimes do things that aren't good enough, good for us. And the reason we're doing them is because even though we know they're not good for us, we're still getting reinforced for doing them, right? So you don't just say to somebody, well, just forget about the rewards. The rewards are what keep the behavior going. But now let's play with that. If somebody is using alcohol primarily for them as a way to calm themselves down, that's the biggest reinforcer. How about if I can teach you some other ways of, of calming yourself down? And how about if I show you how to do it the right way and you learn that those things work? If you learn new ways to manage your anxiety, might it be easier to let go some of the addictive behavior? but there's more to it, right? Alcohol is neurologically, chemically addictive. Might we need to intervene, intervene in other ways chemically in your brain to help you avoid some of the worst pain of going through withdrawal. One of the reasons people re-engage with nicotine and alcohol is it hurts like hell to go through withdrawal. It is, and the reward is to avoid the pain or the punishment of withdrawal, okay? So if we know that to be true for some people, then we may need to also intervene at least briefly in, in terms of a chemical intervention to reduce the uh, addictive discomfort, right? But think about the social piece. If I drink too much alcohol on a regular basis because it's through alcohol that I connect to other people, right? People, places, and things, might I need to change my behaviors for a period of time to begin to break some of those uh, reward loops that keep me stuck in there, right? Um, <clears throat> AA recognizes the complexity and NA for, for, uh, for other folks recognize the powerful 
it's not just chemical addictive pieces, but the social and the emotional addictive pieces. And really, recovery requires all three. Now, I've picked addictive behaviors. You could apply this to anything, right? Um, young women with anorexia starve themselves not to be difficult to their mothers and fathers and their friends, but because self-starvation is powerfully associated with reinforcement. And so if you're going to tackle that problem, you need to see what those rewards are. Um, but it can be a wonderful thing too, right? When I was in graduate school, the reason I kept on keeping on through some very unpleasant academic, you know, feeling overwhelmed and feeling stressed was I would get rewarded in a variety of ways. There was reinforcement built in for me to be a decent student. And some of it was external reinforcement, like getting good grades, but it was more than that. Um, and I think people who are really good learners figure out how to move beyond the external reinforcement and find internal reinforcement. Think about the things that you do, not just because people think you're wonderful, but because it makes you feel good inside. That's called internal reinforcement. External reinforcement also counts too, right? When you work your job, whatever that job is, one of the external reinforcers, they give you this thing called money, and you can then trade that money in for other rewards, like food and cats, cat toys, you know, stuff like that. <clears throat> okay. One more thing I want to focus on with operant conditioning, and this has to do with a, a mental health piece that's really important. Um, sometimes people hold on to psychological symptoms because even though those symptoms are painful and punishing, they are also reinforcing and rewarding. Now, the term for that in the mental health field is GAIN, G-A-I-N. So you'll sometimes hear a psychologist say or think, what gain is my client receiving for holding on to some of her symptoms of depression. Let me be real clear. There's a whole lot of other reasons people get stuck emotionally than gain. Gain is not the whole story, but it is sometimes part of that story. And so we need to explore that just a little bit. Imagine you and I are family. Terrifying thought, right? Imagine you and I are family and I get depressed and you care about me. Because you care about me, could you, without knowing it consciously, begin to almost reinforce some of my symptoms of depression? So let's think about what depression looks like, right? There's hopelessness, there's helplessness, but also your physical energy in a severe depression drops towards zero. Um, it's hard to move, it's hard to get off the couch. If I'm depressed and you're my son or daughter, my, you start to pick up some of the slack around the house that I would normally do when I'm not depressed. And as much as you're helping me, if I don't want to do those things, I may or may not even know that consciously. Could I hold on to some of my low energy exhaustion? Because once I start to feel better, then you're not going to do those things for me anymore, right? Now, I want to point out that often happens not at the conscious level, but at the subconscious or unconscious level. So if I don't even know that I'm doing that, and you said that to me, I'd probably get really pissed off at you, and I would say, you're full of crap, I'm depressed, right? But, but there's more going on there. Sometimes we hold on to problems in life because even though they're painful and punishing, we are getting some of our needs met. And um, so <clears throat> therapists, um, when we're working with a new client, and we, one of the things we were very interested in sorting out is what is the gain that this person might be getting for holding on to their symptoms? The more reward I get for being miserable, the harder it's going to be for me to let go of my misery, right? Um, <clears throat> okay. Again, I want to ask you to take our discussion on operant conditioning and go to the book and dig into it more more deeply. All right, let's move now to the third and final type of learning we're going to talk about um, in this lecture. And that is a kind of learning, it's called social learning. It's also called observational learning. 
This is not done by all animals. Some animals with very simple brains are simply not capable of doing this uh, more complex type of learning. You and I, other primates, dolphins, social animals like wolves and dogs are masters of it. We're, we're terrific at it. Social learning, the name associated with this is Albert Bandura, B-A-N-D-U-R-A. -A. <clears throat> and it is based on an ability found in some, but not all animals, to automatically observe and imitate others. Think about being human for a moment, right? We, from, from the moment we're born until the day we die, whether we're aware of it consciously or not, you and I are always observing and sometimes imitating what other people are doing around us, right? Now, <clears throat> we're programmed this way. If you're born as a human being, you have a brain that is genetically motivated to observe and model or imitate other beings around us. Now, I just introduced the term modeling. In ordinary English, it's called imitation. In Bandora's social observational learning, it's called modeling. Same thing. Newborn infants love to look at human faces. It's their favorite thing to, to look at. And there is this wonderful research that's been done in pretty recently, which shows that even by the age of two to three weeks old, when you hold your, a baby and your baby's looking at your face and you smile at your baby, they will try to figure out what muscles to move to imitate your smile, right? When we hold our babies and we talk to our babies, they're trying to figure out how to move their lips and tongue and mouth to, to, re, to imitate or model the sound that we're making. But this isn't just something that you and I do as infants as in a children. We do it our whole lives. Uh, let's, take, let's imagine somebody's 30 years old and they just take a brand new job. They've never done this job before. And they're not really getting trained for it. Nobody's really sitting down and taking them through a week of training. If you were that 30-year-old, would you automatically observe the other people around you who are doing the same job and model or imitate what they're doing, right? So if you're, if you're learning to do wait staff and you've never done that before and nobody's really teaching you how, will you watch other waiters around you and will you figure out mentally, but also in your behavior, what to do to make that job work? Now, let's imagine now it's six months later. You've been doing this gig for six months. Will you still have to observe and imitate them? No, because now it's in your head. You know what to do. But somebody new starts tomorrow in that same job. Are you going to be their role model? Right? So we both have role models and we are role models. The term role model comes out of Bindura's observational learning. You and I are genetically programmed to look for role models. We will imitate them. And we won't just imitate the way they act. We'll try to learn, we'll try to imitate, if you know what I mean, the way they think, their beliefs, right? What's going on inside their mind. And then not only do we have role models, we become role models, right? This happens our entire lives. It's a never ending journey. Now, let me take another example. Imagine a, an 11 year old kid or a 12 year old kid who's sitting with dad in the living room. Dad is sucking down his fifth martini of the evening while he's lecturing his son or daughter about the dangers of smoking weed. Dad's words mean squat. What really counts is the child is observing dad's behavior. You know the expression, talk is cheap? That expression is tied to social observational learning. It's less about we, what we say and it's more about what we do. So here's dad using his drug of choice to get high while he's lecturing his son or daughter about the dangers of, of another drug, right? 
Would you agree with me kids are really good at seeing hypocrisy in their in adults? And they should be. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it's important for us to see the gap between what people say and what people do. Um, so how did Bandura figure this stuff out? Bandura, Bandura has an interesting sort of career arc. He was one of the first psychologists in the 1950s to study the effects of watching different types of TV programming on children. I'm the first generation of TV kids. Many of you in this room are now the third generation of TV kids. But in the 1950s, TV was a brand new form of media. Nobody had really studied it. All of the earlier research was really on the effects of listening to the radio on kids. As long as there have been people, there's been parents worried about the effects of new technology on their children. Um, so all of the modern day things, you know, gaming and how gaming affects a kid's development psychologically. Yeah, I mean, I get the concern, but there's nothing new about that. I think, you know, hundreds of years ago when somebody invented the first printing press, people would be, you know, parents were like freaked out about, oh my God, what is this going to do to kids' development? Um, one of the things that Bandora did in his early research, and this is talked about in the book, and it's also, there's a YouTube video if you put in if you put in Bandura Bobo doll, you'll see the original films from the 50s. Is Bandura exposed children of different ages to different types of TV programming? Um, and he early in his research, he focused on aggressive or violent TV programming. And he would have kids of different ages, boys and girls, watch TV programming. And then he would put them in a playroom where there were hundreds of toys to choose from. And he would observe the kinds of uh, the ways in which kids played with toys after watching violence and aggression on TV. He also had a control group of kids. He'd put them into the playroom, but he would not first have them watch uh, aggressive television programs. And what he observed is to some extent, when children watched more aggressive or violent TV shows, they were more likely for a period of time in afterwards to behave, to play in more aggressive ways, to be more likely to hit the Bobo doll, which was one of those blow up plastic dolls. It had weight in the base and he measured the number of times kids would punch that doll, whether they were in the control group or the experimental group. Um, and that, But as time went on, so he found that there was a link between watching aggressive TV shows in terms of at least in the short term affecting a kid's behavior. He then went on, though, to ask the opposite question, which has led to Mr. Rogers and Sesame Street. What about pro-social, not anti-social TV shows, but pro-social TV shows? Shows that stress cooperation, peace, getting along with each other. And of course, what he found and others have found after him is it's not just negative TV programming that children will imitate, but they'll also imitate pro-social positive TV programs. This research eventually led to the development of 50 years, 51 years now, I think it is, of shows like Sesame Street, shows like Mr. Rogers, and so on. Um, all of that original research was done on kids. What became apparent pretty quickly, though, is this is not just a child or teenage thing. Sometimes, you know, parents will say, you know, oh, when you're a teenager, you're just affected by peer pressure too much as if when you become 25, you outgrow it. Never. We are shaped by peer pressure for the rest of our lives. Can we develop the skills to know that's happening and to push back on that? Yes, we can. But even at the age of 80, we're still observing and sometimes modeling what's going on in other people around us. This is not just a, a young person sort of thing. It's a lifelong thing. Now it makes sense, right? How did the human, how did the human animals survive? over thousands of generations of human evolution. It is adaptive to watch what other people are doing and under certain conditions to model or imitate what other people are doing. Um, this is a good thing, right? We learn the rules sometimes, not by what people say, but by doing this observational sort of learning. It can also be useful as a way to get over a fear. If I'm terrified of something, but I observe you face you doing it and nothing bad happens to you, right? 
I might be somewhat more inclined, especially if I see it a number of times, to then model your behavior. So there's a cognitive behavioral te technique that's been around for years, it's called modeling, and it's based on using social observational learning to help somebody get over a particular fear. So Bandura started by studying the effects of TV violence. Bandura was the first psychologist to begin to study this scientifically. There have been hundreds and hundreds of others who have come along in the last 60, 65 years and built on this uh, model. <clears throat> and um, it, it takes us to the issue of role models. We all have role models in our lives. We had them when we were little kids. We have them now and we'll have them the rest of our lives. From one point of view, you could argue, choose your role models carefully because the people who are our role models, we're gonna become more and more like them as time goes on. Role models can teach us things in two different ways. They can teach us what to do, but sometimes they can also teach us what not to do. And often it's a blend of both. So imagine a son growing up in a family where dad is physically abusive of mom. So this little boy grows up over a period of years watching dad be physically and or emotionally abusive of his mother. If the boy primarily identifies with his dad, I, I, I want to be like my dad, then is that boy at risk for becoming an abuser himself? Yes. Could work the opposite way. What about if the boy, instead of identifying with his dad as a role model, does a significant amount of what is called de-identifying with his dad as a role model? My father's a model of the man I don't want to become. Then, in that scenario, would that boy perhaps be more likely to grow up to become a man who, because he de-identified with his father's violence against toward women, becomes actually does not repeat that pattern and bring it to the next generation. So that can happen too. And that's also true with substance abuse. Sometimes a child de-identifies with the, the substance abuse of their parents and kind of builds a lifestyle in the opposite direction. Now it helps if a child has an alternative role model. So let me go back to my first example. Imagine there's a grandfather who provides an alternative way to that grandson about acting and thinking and treating women. Could that alternative male role model actually make it more likely that that grandson will not grow up to become an abuser? It's one thing to know that you're not, you're not modeling somebody, but it sure as heck helps to have an alternative, more positive role model. So when we look at families where there's been a lot of disruption and chaos, what will, and, and then you think, God, this, this kid is doing so well, how come? One of the things you'll sometimes see is that there was another adult, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, a friend's mom or dad, a teacher, even a teacher, who provided an alternative sort of uh, way and a healthier way of teaching that child to become an adult. Okay. Again, I'm gonna focus you back on Bandura social learning in the readings. So let's just think about what we've done. We've spent the last, I don't know how long, uh, looking at three different types of learning. I am going to uh, figure out with my daughter's help how to post this onto YouTube. And again, um, I wanna remind you, you need to go to the textbook and my review sheet to learn more about this. Um, obviously, this is a first in a series of other lectures that are coming, but uh, I've survived the first one, and I hope you have too, and we'll go from there. So take good care, everybody. Uh, be well, and you'll hear again from me soon.